This is BBC Radio 4, where now it's time for Call You and Yours with Winifred Robinson. Hello, welcome to our regular Tuesday phone-in. Today we want to talk about trade unions. We're asking what trade unions have done for you. Call 03700 100 444 now. There are record numbers in work, but has the fall in union membership left them vulnerable? Yesterday's report from MPs on the collapse of BHS says the ordinary workers were the only ones to suffer, losing their jobs and pensions as Sir Philip Green's family walked away rich beyond the dreams of avarice. In a separate inquiry, MPs heard evidence from another self-made billionaire, Mike Ashley of Sports Direct. They described conditions at his company warehouse as Victorian, with staff too scared to stay off sick. Drivers at the delivery company Yodel are taken to social media to complain of working conditions they say are akin to modern-day slavery. Do workers need unions to protect them, or should employment laws and regulations be enough? What do you think? What have the unions done for you? Call us now, please, 03700 100 444. You can send text messages to 84844. Comment on social media, hashtag you and yours, or email us, you and yours at bbc.co.uk. Some of you have been in touch already. Warren Griffiths lives in London. I asked what trade unions have done for him. Well, it was a, a dispute where I've uh, been forced to resign my position. I've then contacted the union, um, you know, for some advice and pretty much they wanted me to settle, you know, out of court, you know, with a, a £2,000 offer. But you didn't think that was fair? No, no, because at, at the end of the day, I believed I was a victim, and so accepting two grand uh, was pretty much not in the best of my interest. Because I've refused that, it's then seen me buy a, a law book, study that on employment law, study my rights, and then when the union solicitor abandoned me because he stated I didn't have a case, the respondent, the other side of the argument, made me an offer of £4,000. I was still unhappy the way I'd been treated and refused the £4,000 offer. And then they made me an offer of £10,000, which is a little strange after um, a union has said you've not got a case. Why do you think the union weren't vigorous in taking your case, Warren? I think with uh, constructive dismissal cases, I've been told on a number of occasions that these specific cases are, are very hard to fight. But what's frustrating more than anything is if you've actually got the evidence to back up your claim, the, the union still don't seem to look into the specifics of, of each case, you know, take it on a one-to-one a -one basis. As soon as they hear the word constructive dismissal, they um, turn their back. I mean, I've got a, a small family. All this, try to study a 245-page bundle of evidence, try to uh, cross-examine witness statements, um, skeleton arguments, closing arguments, exchanges between solicitors, paperwork between the, the courts, and the fact that I've had to go through all this uh, alone is, is completely, completely unacceptable, I, I believe. Warren, thank you. Leslie Crowther-Smith is a teacher. Leslie, what have the trade unions done for you? Well, I am a member of the NUT and I had a very traumatic time about eight or nine years ago where uh, there was a complaint from a parent and uh, we had a relatively new head who initially gave me a warning then put me on gardening leave. To, it happened around April, May of that year. And then when I came back to work in the September, she promptly suspended me. And initially I was supported by my local rep, who was very good, came to meetings and various things and wrote letters. But then when it went to suspension, they upped the ante and I had an area rep. And he was absolutely incredible. He looked at my case in great detail, looked at the law, looked at the process that they had already put in place, and he just supported me the whole way. What was the outcome, Leslie? The outcome was that I did in fact lose my job purely because the school had actually replaced me. But have you managed to find another one? Yes. I lost my job purely because they had given my job away. But I didn't lose my career. I was given a full reference. In fact, I was able to write my reference. What do you think would have happened to you if you had not been a member of the union? 
I would have lost my job, I would have lost my career, I probably would have lost my mind as well. What did you think about what Warren said, that uh, in his case he believes the trade union reps were just too quick to be willing to do a deal with his um, former employers? I think that's absolutely appalling. I totally agree with him that you pay your subs and you expect to get their support. And I think, especially in teaching, you would have to be mad not to be a part of a union. Why? Because... You are dealing with children who can make false claims for various reasons, and there have been plenty of cases of those. You can have accusations by parents, and you have to fight. And if I had had to go to a lawyer, it would have cost me thousands and thousands of pounds. And had the result been the same at the end, I won my case they would have had to pay those thousands and thousands of pounds. As it is, they don't have to pay it because my union provides that for me for free. Leslie, thank you. Um, Daniel Hall is in Dorset. Daniel, what have the trade unions done for you? They haven't done too much for me in my industry. I work in private security, so there are industry representatives in all locations that I go to, whether it's being securing a building site, a company, or anything along those lines. The problem we have in this industry and in retail is the contract system set up, most notably zero-hour contracts and low-hour contracts. Previous Conservative governments have been at odds with the unions. They do not like the added power that they have against the government. But in terms of taking the powers away, they haven't reassured someone in my position by giving me better rights as an employee. Companies in security like to hire people on zero-hour contracts. So it gives them the flexibility to apply the numbers of security officers where they need them. But at the same time, it gives you the veiled threat pressure of, if I say I can't work today because I've got previous commitments, if you say that too many times in a short period, the company may refuse to then offer you jobs. So is the contract turn, that it, that is your big problem, Daniel? It isn't whether yeah. or not you've got someone to represent you if perhaps um, you're being harshly treated at work? There is someone that I can always talk to at work. Union representatives, in my experience, have always been very able to be, you can approach them, you can talk to them about legal situations. But when it comes down to if I'm being dismissed from my position because I do not fit with their job requirements, for example, this would come down to if I were not accepting enough hours of work, even though I'm on a zero hours contract they could dismiss me. The unions in their position could not help me because the contract states the company does not have to give me anything more than zero hours a week. You couldn't fight that. You couldn't take up a union representative and say fight my corner because you've only got that contract. When it comes to retail, from my experience in retail, the usual contract shifts are between 16 and 20 hours at the moment. That's not enough to feed a family. It's not enough to pay rent, especially not in the South, in Dorset. So I have to get a second job or constantly apply for overtime, which puts me in the pressure of having to provide for my company or else they will remove me and I have to find another job. Trade unions don't seem to be able to help me in these situations because of the contract. Daniel Hall, Leslie Crowther-Smith and Warren Griffiths talking to me earlier. Call you and yours. Tell us what the unions have done for you. Ring 03700 100 444. Trade union membership and power reached its peak in 1979, and so did the number of days lost through strikes. In 1979, the winter of discontent saw public sector strikes bringing the UK to a near standstill. We're going down a road that we don't enjoy going down, but the circumstances of the situation have forced us to do this. Aren't you in fact though striking against the Labour government and not against the Ford Motor Company? Well, we are striking against the company using the government guidelines as a shield against our submissions. It's the picketing of the Northwest major oil terminals by the striking Texaco drivers that's led to the region's petrol famine. Some patients are now being restricted to one hot meal a day and volunteers have been manning many kitchens. Sandwiches and soup are all patients have been having in several hospitals this evening. Union action in the Northwest has also affected many crematoria and graveyards, though pickets have kept out of sight when funerals have been scheduled. As you may have heard, none of London's regular ambulance crews is on duty and 50 army vehicles are now available to answer emergency calls. The place is practically being run by strikers' committees yeah. and that they're using language such as they are allowing access to food. They are allowing certain lorries to go through. Yeah, yeah. 
They have no right to prevent them from going. In the aftermath, Margaret Thatcher swept to power on a promise to tame the unions. She did. Union membership has halved. It was 13 million in 1970. It's 6.5 million now. Today, around a quarter of the workforce is unionised, but the figure masks a huge disparity. More than half of all workers in the public sector belong to a union, compared with around one in ten in private sector firms. Women and professionals are more likely to be in a union now, unskilled manual workers less likely. Professor Geraint Johns has studied these trends. He's Director of Research at Lancaster University's Work Foundation. Professor Johns, what did Margaret Thatcher do then to free Britain from the scourge of strikes? Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Mrs Thatcher certainly did some things to free the UK from the scourge of strikes, but there are other things that have been going on over that time period as well. But she changed the laws, been, didn't she? She, she, changed, she changed the laws, and that had a big effect on the power that trade unions had in wage negotiations, and particularly to strike. Uh, but it's important to recognise that's just one patch in the patchwork quilt of things that have change the impact that unions have in our economy. So there's yes. been a big change in the industry mix, for example, a uh, big move away from big industries such as coal and steel, which were highly unionised. So tell us then what happened to the economy to produce the pattern of trade union membership that we see now? Well, we've moved very much more towards an emphasis on services. Uh, a lot more employment is in small and medium enterprises where unionisation is, uh, is less of a factor. Uh, we've seen also a change in the gender mix of employment and a change generally in the kind of work that people are doing. There's a lot more flexible working going on, uh, a lot more part-time work going on. We heard from uh, David Hall about the kind of employment that we get in private security uh, firms where there's a lot of zero hour contracts and people on these contracts tend to be less likely to join trade unions. You could say, couldn't you, that unskilled workers, even in low paid jobs, don't need union representation necessarily. They need good laws and regulations to protect them and those laws need to be enforced. There's a bunch of things that can lead to the same kind of outcomes. So in a, a good employer that emphasises good working relations, that has long term implicit contracts with its employees, they'll be using very sophisticated human resource management techniques that emphasise a good relationship between its employees and the employer. Uh, so bad work practices tend not to occur in firms of that kind. Uh, there are regulations that the government can put in place. So we have regulations about things like maternity leave, for example, discrimination. Uh, there are, there's also the discipline of the market. So a firm is unlikely to want to acquire a bad reputation as an employer. And then there are unions. And each of these different mechanisms for securing good work in an employment context operates differently in different types of firms, different industries, different sizes of firms, informal methods tend to work well in small firms. Formal methods where unions come more to the fore tend to work in larger enterprises. Professor Geraint Johns, thanks for coming on. Please share your experience. Tell us what trade unions have done for you. Ring 03700 100 444. We have callers waiting and Barbara is on the line. Barbara, tell us your experience then. What have trade unions done for you? Um, I must say that I, I am for trade unions, but they got too powerful, especially in the 70s and we were threatened by them several times. We also paid union dues for our workers that we were in construction uh, that they didn't want to be in, but we had to pay it because they said they blacklist us. So we had very bad experiences of unions, but I still think unions have a purpose and obviously a lot of your callers have, uh, have, have been satisfied. So, um, you know, that's what they're there for. Not at the moment. I can see all these threats starting again. It's very similar in the um, left wing of the Labour Party. Barbara, which, do you by think... The way, it... I have voted for. <laughs> um, Barbara, can I ask you, do you think we need a different kind of union to address the sort of problems that um, Daniel Hall, one of our first callers, mentioned? This business of being on a contract that is called flexible, but it actually means that employers are very frightened of ever refusing to come in even if they need two jobs to make ends meet well being in employ being having employed a lot of people over the years me and my husband i think anybody that doesn't treat their employees properly um well they want their brains tested because obviously that's 
the backbone of your business, whoever you employ. Even and though, though, Barbara... All these fair, you know, th- these deals that are on at the moment, it's only because we've got a, 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 an influx of a lot of people and they can do it. I, I don't think it's a fair way of employing people. So you think that if we had fewer migrants, then we would have well, people who wouldn't work for... but we've, we've got you said sorry so you said an influx moment. you said an influx of people yeah yeah well you know there's plenty of people now in this country and unfortunately that's what's happened um uh, ruthless people who who think they can just employ anybody and give them whatever they sort of i, I think that's wrong barbara thank I you i think it should be stopped thanks so much for ringing that's um, all right Bye. you can you can text us to answer the question, what have unions done for you? You can email us, you and yours, at bbc.co.uk. We always read all of your emails. Our reporter, Bob Walker, is doing that as the emails come in. Bob, what are people saying? Several people have been say they've been helped in recent times by the union, but quite a few in the public sector. But there are many with longer memories of those dark times that you mentioned earlier. Phil Creek says, I worked in the car industry in the late 1970s. The restrictive practices dictated by the unions were appalling to witness at first hand. We mustn't go back to that. I knew the first thing Margaret Thatcher would do would be to close a factory in which I worked, and so it proved, and that was justifiable. However, an effective union organisation can be a force for good. Despite my exper- the experiences in the 70s, I maintained membership of various unions throughout most of my working life. And someone who ran a Morris car dealership in those troubled times said there were bits and pieces of parts that just weren't delivered because British Leyland was on strike. It ended up damaging his dealership. He blames the unions. But finally, Rick joined a large public sector organisation in the 80s. He said there was a major bullying culture with grown men reduced to tears. And he learnt a great deal by being in a trade union. Being a union member has protected his earnings and secured his conditions and protected his working environment. And he adds, it's a shame we don't teach school children about trade unions and tell them that 99% of what we do is about the welfare of workers, not about striking, not about pickets like they see on TV. Got a text here on the screen. No union where I work. We're treated terribly. We can't go to HR to get any help as those people work for the company. I'm not in a position to twit, to, to, to quit. This job has caused me so much stress and unhappiness. I've lost some of my hair through stress. The time now, 26 minutes to one. This is Call You and Yours, our weekly phone-in. I'm Winifred Robinson. Today we're asking, what's your experience of trade unions? You can call us now, 03700 100 444. I'll be taking more of your calls in a minute. But first, Martha Carney is going to tell us about the world at one. Martha. Thanks, Winifred. Well, a church has come under attack in Normandy. Police say that an 84-year-old priest is dead and someone else is seriously injured. The assailants have also been killed. So, after the massacre in Nice, is this another Islamist terror attack on French soil? We'll have the latest. New figures are out today for people who've died after contact with the police in England and Wales. Many have mental health problems. So is there a need for a new approach? And the government has announced a review into hate crime, as figures apparently show a rise since the Brexit vote. We'll discuss whether there is a connection. That's all in half an hour. Thanks, Martha. In the wake of the reports about corporate greed at BHS and Victorian working conditions at the Warehouse of Sports Direct, we're talking about the unions on our phone-in today. Union membership has halved since the 1970s. Has that left workers vulnerable? Call us now, please. Tell us what the unions have done for you. Ring 03700 100 444. Clara is in Hastings. Clara, what have the unions done for you? Oh, gosh, absolutely nothing. Um, I think it's interesting that you're saying that um, this is in the line of uh, bosses. I found that unions are just as greedy themselves. They're not actually supporting the little guy. Um, I've had three separate occasions um, where there's uh, I've been members of the unions and, and been badly let down each time, each in its own way quite bad. But, um, yeah, one that, that was absolutely disastrous. Um, yeah, I mean, from um, minor issues about um, administrative stuff about... Uh, cancelling subscriptions when you've left the union and no longer working so you're you're really poor um but still having to pay union members because membership because they just don't cancel it um to uh, a, a separate issue of um when, when you're in a multi-union workplace um that if some one union has gone on strike that um the other union then can't um tell you give you support on on well, basically, obviously, they, they can't legally support you if you then strike as well. So their legal advice is that you have to 
across the picket, but that causes immense ideological problems for someone to be having to try and cross the picket. Clara, um, how recent is your experience? Um, this is going back six years ago. But so it's quite recently. That, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't around for the, the, the days of the 70s, but I just... I, I was really appalled. Most recently, um, I was in a position where I found myself becoming a whistleblower and then bullied for that by my management. Um, and I was left completely without union representation, including an employment tribunal. And when I tried to complain about that to the union, they, they just, they, they know that there's no arbitration for what, what they do wrong. So you, you've, you've got nowhere to, to, um, to challenge anything they do. Clara, thanks for coming on and thank you for coming on and telling us about that. Um, I've got a, a text, a similar text here. A man called Owen says, I was previously a member of a union. I was advised over and over um, to join so that I could be an apprentice engineer. I found my membership pays for union members to have time off regular duties, which we then have to backfill and constantly strangling process and modernisation in the business. Paul Novak is the Deputy General Secretary of the TUC. Um, Paul, you've heard uh, negative views there from um, both Clara and from Owen uh, by text. Mm -hmm. What is the general attitude to trade union membership now when you survey people? Well, afternoon, Winifred. Good afternoon. I, I think the general attitude of, of the public towards unions is a very supportive one. Uh, consistently, polls uh, show us that around about three quarters of the public uh, believe that unions play an essential role uh, in workplaces. And I think that's borne out day in, day out uh, by, by the work that unions do, literally representing tens of thousands of people each and every day, Winifred, whether it's on uh, negotiating with the boss around things like pay, on health and safety, on giving them access to new learning opportunities. I mean, the range of activities that unions do in workplaces up and down the country uh, is, is huge and I think the fact that we have got six and a half million people in this country who voluntarily pay their union dues uh, every month demonstrates that unions have still got a uh, real value. We are by some distance the largest voluntary organisations in the country and we play a positive role in workplaces up and down the country. One of the first listeners who got in touch said mm -hmm. he needs to be freed from a zero hours contract yeah, and yeah. so long as his contract is the way it is the unions can't really help him. What do you say to that? Well I think there are things that unions can do so if you if you think about zero hours contracts they are endemic in some parts we know of, of, of sectors like retail but it's interesting that the big four uh, uh, supermarkets in this country don't use zero hours contracts and a large part of that is down to the work that, that unions uh, have done to press employers to employ people on decent terms and conditions. Why and if you aren't think you about, signing more workers then in the places where they most need help? Well, we're beginning to make progress. Uh, private sector union membership has risen each year for the last uh, five years, but we've still got a long way to go in some yes, sectors I like hospitality. Yes, I those figures, but it says it's statistically insignificant. I'm, I'm guessing it's because the population's grown at the same time. Yeah, but I think it, we're beginning to make inroads, and I think if you think about the situation we've seen recently in Sports Direct, I mean, I think that's a really good example. It was the tenacity of the union uh, in bringing those issues into the public domain, highlighting those issues, representing those workers at employment tribunals, making the case for those workers in Sports Direct, which exposed the practices that were going on there, uh, but we also know are happening in other parts of the economy as well. So the, the obviously a long way for us to go in terms sure, of building sure. membership, but the key thing is that we've still got that important role to play in workplaces. The, ownish, the owner of Sports Direct mm -hmm. said um, after the parliamentary report was published that he was in constructive negotiations with the union unite. Can you tell us what happened to that? I, I, I can't tell you uh, chapter and verse on that, Winifred, because I'm being part of those discussions, but I hope he is in constructive discussions with Unite, because when Mike Ashley went in front of the Select Committee, he was asked the question directly about why he didn't engage uh, with the union, and he said that he could look after his workforce better than the union could. Well, clearly it wasn't the case. And if you take Unite as an example, or indeed a whole range of our other unions, I mean, think about some of the real success stories in the UK economy. Uh, Jaguar Land Rover, part of our aerospace industries. These are areas where unions play a really important role, working together with employers, representing employees and making a big difference in terms of delivering effective uh, organisations. Could I ask you briefly if you because we've got a lot mm -hmm. of callers now yeah. waiting to come on. Uh, Theresa May is talking about making capitalism work for everyone. Mm -hmm. 
Could the unions have a role in that? I think that, that unions have got an absolutely essential role to play, particularly in, 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 in the, the midst of the, the Brexit fallout. A real, we need a national action plan to secure jobs and investment in this country. Unions should be at the heart of that. And if you look at uh, what happens across most of Western Europe, for example, there are 19 countries where workers have places on the board. I think it's right that the Prime Minister is talking about uh, looking at that situation here in the UK. If it's good enough for German workers, good enough for French workers, it's good enough for workers in this You're country as well. You're still feared, though, aren't you, regarded as wreckers? people who cause strikes out of touch with the members and I just don't think that's rooted in the reality of, of today's workplaces I mean if you look at the vast majority of union members will never go uh, on strike those who do take strike action don't do it lightly they, they you know they lose a day's pay they don't like taking industrial action uh, what we don't hear and maybe it's not surprising that you don't hear this in the press Winifred but it's the positive work unions are doing day in day out a quarter of a million people each year getting access to new uh, training and learning opportunities why because of the work the unions have done uh, with their employers that's the sort of positive difference we make in workplaces day in day out Paul Novak Deputy General Secretary of the TUC thank you very much for co coming on tell us what the unions have done for you please call us now 03700 100 444 Mike is on the line he's in Dorset Mike what have the unions done for you they gave me education. I mean, when I left school, I had no education at all. I was useless at school. I hated it and all the rest of it because I was bullied at school. So when I started work and I basically wanted to join a local authority at 17, they wouldn't allow me because the men said they would not allow, would not work with a 17-year-old because the 17-year-old was only paid half wages. At 18, you got full wages and they said that was unfair, so they refused. So at 18, I joined a local authority. And my dad was a lo was the branch secretary then, and when he retired, I got involved in the trade union movement. Why do you think trade union membership has declined? Some commentators think it's because we no longer think collectively; we think of ourselves as individuals. Do you think that's true? It's the bad name they got in the in the seventies. I mean, this, you just had somebody say they were always on strike. They're not. I mean, I was involved. I was employed by the same employer for forty two years. And basically, I was on strike for, in the last 10 years, three single days. And in a period before that, it was a six-week solid sport cake in the 70s. Now, I don't call that being always on strike. So, right. I just think they've got a bad name. But I also think the TUC could do a lot to actually encourage people. They, the TUC, as, as a whole, could go around and talk to schools about trade unionism. Not the individual unions, but trade unionism, from the toll model, puddle martyrs up. That's where it starts, because they've got a bad name, they come into the workplace, they talk to other people who've already got a bad experience or whatever, but that's where it starts from. You've got to get people involved, and people do get involved. I mean, you also have, it also comes down to the individual unions inviting new members. Now, when I was there, Brown Secretary, we actually set up something with the employer where I was a branch secretary. I was allowed to send a letter. They would give me new employees' names and their department, and the union would write them a letter inviting them to join the union. It was their choice. There wasn't any pressure, but we did tell them straight that our rules was, if you join now, we would represent you. But if you get into trouble, don't come to us then, because I'm sorry, our rules say you have to be a member for three months before we can help. And that's Mike, how I did it. thanks and for it calling. Worked. I'm going to stop you there because we've got a lot of people now waiting to come on the programme. Um, Colin McGrath is in Kelso in Scotland. Um, Colin, what is your experience then? What have trade unions done for you? Yes, hello. Um, hello. I'm, I've been for 33 years part-time judge member in the Employment Tribunal in Manchester. And um, since, since 2013, with the introduction of fees for bringing a claim, it's now £1,200 to bring a claim, went from nothing to £1,200, um, it meant that our caseloads dropped by over 80%. And um, I think that it is time for the trade unions really to, to make, the, make a difference and start recruiting people, particularly in the private sector, or the private sector to, to, to start using principles like there are in the um, John Lewis Partnership, where the employees are involved and have an effective say. Do you and think then that um, it has reached a point where employees do need protection from unscrupulous bosses more than they did? Absolutely, and ACAS have recognised this. ACAS Conciliation Service um, have said that it, what's happening now is that they, they have to do, uh, in recent years, they've had to do what they call pre-conciliation before any claim that comes in to the tribunal. So they try and get a settlement with an employer. Employers are now telling ACAS that 
we're not bothering to settle anymore because we know they won't bring a claim because they can't afford it. So it's totally injustice, generally. Colin McGrath, thank you. And Dan is on the line in Bristol. Dan, tell me, what have trade unions done for you? Oh, I used to be a regional advisor when I was one of the large um, national unions that like, used to support um, employees with their um, queries in uh, cases. And what did you find, Dan? Uh, well, some members' expectations are completely mismanaged, so they could get themselves into a whole world of trouble. And of course, you only ever hear one side of the story initially, and then when you know any good trade union person will find out the rest of the facts. And then you find out exactly sometimes what the member's done and you think there is no positive way out of this. Um, you know, or, or, the, or the outcome they're wanting is completely unreasonable. Um, and of course, you've got to think about both the union's um, uh, reputation as well as the individual's long-term professional reputation. So what did, you tend, what did you tend to do, Dan? in those circumstances? Uh, well, I mean, I was quite open with my members. I asked, I read through their case notes and I said, um, can I be frank with you, Mr. or Mrs. X? Um, and normally half the time they'd say yes. And sometimes it would have to be as frank as saying, are you mad? You'd be absolutely mad to challenge this final written warning. I'll send you through some case notes on people that have been dismissed for similar things, you know, through the tribunal system and have found to have been fair. Um, you know, when they've read them, they've gone, oh my God, you know, I didn't realise I could get dismissed for doing things like that. So, Dan, I don't know if you heard our first caller, Warren Griffiths. Um, he was told by his union he didn't have a case um, and to accept yeah. £2,000. Then the employer upped it to four. Their latest offer's ten. Yeah, that's a, I mean, uh, that is a common strategy by some employers who don't want to go through uh, the tribunal system. Um, because obviously you're going through the tribunal system, it's public, it's a public record, whereas if you do your deal before you get to the tribunal, then, you know, it's not in the public limelight and the employer is not, you know, negatively positioned, which most often is the case, the employer gets the negative right of the treatment, the tribunal system. But sometimes it is also about the probability that success of the case. As he mentioned, constructive dismissal is really, really hard to prove unless you've got the best evidence there is. And a lot of the legal people supporting the union might say, you know, it's the probability is just too close to cut it. Dan. So it might be better for the person to accept a deal rather than go through the rigmarole of the union. But as always, no one knows what's going to happen on the day you get to the tribunal. Dan, thank you. And Bernadette Rowe, what is your experience? What have unions done for you? Oh, it was a terrible experience in the 70s. Absolutely awful. Uh, it's clouded my view of unions, I think, uh, to this day. What happened? Um, I worked in a small design studio on the south coast, there were only about five of us working there, it was a very small outfit, and uh, the print union suddenly decided that anybody doing graphic design, graphic art, paste up art, all had to belong to a union, a subsidiary of their union, and two blokes came down from London to see my boss and said, um, if you don't join, uh, we're going to black your work, and in fact, it consequently loads and loads of even one-man band um, freelancers all had their work blacked and it uh, was the time of magazines and newspapers all had blank pages where they refused to pr um, print people's work. Um, they saw my boss, they wouldn't see us, they wouldn't speak to the we five employees. Uh, they said, um, there's no rule book yet, we haven't written it. Uh, there are no terms and conditions. You've just got to join, pay your money, and then you can, we will print your work. And, and so, even though the law has changed to prevent that sort of thing happening now, that, is, that has coloured your view of unions, Bernadette, to this it day? It has. Because it has. And I come from a, 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 a family, um, long-standing union supporters, and I just was... I couldn't believe it was it was real blackmail. The money was going to go to this uh, the print union. Uh, I don't know what they did with it. Probably paid their officials. Um, I was only earning sixteen quid a week, and it would have been a sort of a lump out of that. Bernadette, um, I'm going to stop you because we've got callers waiting, and um, 
Bob in the studio with me is reading an awful lot of emails and he wants to read some of them out. Bob? Well, interesting hearing from the, I think she was a graphic artist, um, Bernadette. That's Here's a right. concrete example of helping someone who's involved in the arts. Pam Foley says she's a member of the Artist Union of England. I, I know that's a very new union. I think it was just last month it was it began. Now, she says, I've used their rates of pay document when I apply for jobs or write a grant application to determine what I expect to be paid. It's very important for visual artists who previously have had no representation whatsoever. Another example of someone being helped, Philip Warren, he joined a trade union in his 50s when he was th uh, threatened with dismissal by an employer when he was no longer capable of work following a stroke. He uh, said the trade union provided invaluable support with their presence at meetings and their legal uh, advice. But on the other side of the coin, Linda says, I have two memories of industrial action that have affected my family for the worst. The first was a strike that affected the removal of corpses from hospital to funeral parlours. Because my grandmother died during this strike, the family was unable to pay their last respects to their mother at a funeral parlour. Another strike was by the National Union of Teachers, led to the cancellation of the daughter's trip abroad. And she didn't like the lesson that the teachers were giving the youngsters. If you act like a toddler having a tantrum, she says, you're more likely to get your own way. Thanks, Bob. Um, Car Carmel Wilkinson is on the line. Um, Carmel, what is your Hello. experience of unions? Well, um, back in the 90s, uh, Unison supported myself and a colleague with an equal pay claim. It was quite a long and torturous process, but we won our case and received back pay, which for me, I was able to put the money towards paying for um, doing my master's degree, which put me on the on the path to much better career opportunities for the future. So it's really significant and we had a tremendous amount of support from Unison. Did you make history? No. <laughs> <laughs> Someone had gone no. before you and done that. In our very small way, it was, it was significant because, you know, it was a recognition in the, in the workplace that, that you have to pay women the same as men for doing work of equal value. Carmel, but thanks I, for calling. Greg Chapman is in Kent. Um, Greg, what have unions done for you? Hi Winifred, um, I was uh, with a company that didn't recognise any unions but I was a union member myself. Um, they threatened to sack me because I refused to do some work that I thought was dangerous. Um, went into the meeting for the sacking with the union rep who came in with all sorts of um, information and stuff that he got from the um, from uh, the companies that made the products that I was that I'd refused to use. Um, I wasn't sacked, um, the uh, union proved the point and what that did was that proved to a lot of other workers that by being a union member um, it actually did make a difference. Loads of other people, employees joined up and then the, un then the company was forced to recognise the union and um, I became the health and safety rep the union at the company, uh, conditions improved, safety improved, everything improved, uh, not just for us workers but for the company as well. Greg Chapman, thank you. Well, we're coming to the end of our time today. Um, Paul Novak, the Deputy General Secretary of the TUC, is listening. Paul, what does the law say about the right to join a trade union now? Can anybody uh, set up a union branch, no matter how small the firm? But absolutely everybody has the right to join a union um, and, and I would encourage everybody who's listening out there who isn't a union member to exercise uh, that right and there are rules in place then if there are a number of people in the workplace, a certain number of people in the workplace then the, uni the, the employer has to recognise you to negotiate things like pay and uh, uh, holidays and, and, and so on but the, the crucial thing is Winifred, everybody has a right to join a union, it doesn't matter whether you work on a zero hours contract, a short hours contract, uh, whether your employer tells you you're full Normally self-employed, you're employed through an agency. Exercise that right. It's one of the most important rights you can exercise. Join a union, get active in a union, make a difference in your workplace. And what's it likely to cost? Uh, it, it varies from union to union. Average union member maybe pays two or three pounds a week. It depends on your income. Uh, it depends on the profession uh, that you're in. Quite often unions have uh, rates for part-timers or those who are, 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 are low paid. But it's, you know, maybe the cost of a, a newspaper or a cup of coffee uh, each week. But the difference it makes, not just in 
terms of helping out when there are problems, but those positive things as well, helping to, to access, you've heard from some of your callers, new, new skills, new opportunities, the opportunity to progress in your career, that's the difference a union can make, and I think the difference unions do make in workplaces up and down the country. What would you say to those people who say that you spoiled it for yourselves because there have been calls for there to be a single line, a single phone line that people can call if they're interested in joining a union, but you've all been too busy fighting each other for memberships? Well, I don't recognise that, that you know, unions fighting each other for members, but I do know that we are absolutely committed working together, all of our unions in the TUC, to reach out to the next generation of union members and activists. So at our Congress in September, we'll be launching a brand new initiative to reach out to young workers to make sure they've got a voice in the workplace as well, because oh, it doesn't no, matter what job you do, there's a union for you and an opportunity to join. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who called in. Bob, I think you've got a couple of emails to finish. Well, I've had a lot of emails from people saying their jobs were saved by union intervention. But to finish on one anonymous caller, believes trade unions are taking subscriptions under false pretenses from new workers. She says since unless you've been working for the same company for a couple of years when it comes to dismissal, she says it can do little for you. My son was persuaded to introduce the union to his newly opened company and was then sacked on trumped up charges. She says the union did nothing to help and it now seems her son is blacklisted. That's it. We'll be back again tomorrow, same time, quarter past twelve.